It's a story about, uh, told to me by a friend of mine who's an Aikido master. His name is Terry Dobson. The train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of Tokyo on a drowsy spring afternoon. Our car was comparatively empty, a few housewives with their kids in tow, some old folks going shopping. I gazed absently at the dusty, at the drab houses and dusty hedgerows. At one station, the doors opened, and suddenly the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man bellowing violent, incomprehensible curses. The man staggered into our car. He wore labor's clothing, and he was big, drunk, and dirty. Screaming, he swung at a woman holding a baby. The blow sent her spinning into the laps of an elderly couple. It was a miracle that the baby was unharmed. Terrified, the couple jumped up and scrambled towards the other end of the car. The laborer aimed a kick at the retreating back of the old woman, but missed as she scuttled to safety. This so enraged the drunk that he grabbed the metal pole in the center of the car and tried to wrench it out of its stanchion. I could see that one of his hands was cut and bleeding. The train lurched ahead, the passengers frozen with fear. I stood up. I was young then some 20 years ago and in pretty good shape. I had been putting in a solid eight hours of Aikido training nearly every day for the past three years. I liked to throw and grapple. I thought I was tough. The trouble was my martial skill was untested in actual combat. As students of Aikido we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher had said again and again, is the art of reconciliation. Whoever has the mind to fight has broken his connection with the universe. If you try to dominate people, you're already defeated. We study how to resolve conflict, not how to start it. I listened to his words. I tried hard. I even crossed the street to avoid the pinball punks who lounged around the train station. My forbearance exalted me. I felt both tough and holy. In my heart, however, I wanted an absolutely legitimate opportunity <laughs> whereby I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. This is it, I said to myself <laughs> as I got to my feet. People are in danger. If I don't do something fast, somebody will probably get hurt. Seeing me stand up, the drunk recognized the chance to focus his rage. Aha! He roared. A foreigner! You need a lesson in Japanese manners! I held on lightly to the commuter strap overhead and gave him a slow look of disgust and dismissal. I planned to take this turkey apart, but he had to make the first move. I wanted him mad, so I pursed my lips and blew him an insolent kiss. All right, he hollered. You're going to get a lesson. He gathered himself for a rush at me. A fraction of a second before he could move, someone shouted, Hey! It was ear splitting. I remember the strangely joyous, qu lilting quality of it as though you and a friend had been searching diligently for something and he had suddenly stumbled upon it. Hey! I wheeled to my left, the drunk spun to his right, we both stared down at a little old Japanese man. He must have been well into his seventies, this tiny gentleman, sitting there immaculate in his kimono. He took no notice of me but beamed delightedly at the laborer as though he had a most important, most welcome secret to share. Come here, come here and talk to me, he motioned to the old man. The big man followed as if on a string. He planted his feet belligerently in front of the old gentleman and roared above the clacking wheels, Why the hell should I talk to you? The drunk now had his back to me. If his elbow moved so much as a millimeter, I'd drop him in his socks. The old man continued to beam at the laborer, What you been drinking? He asked, his eyes sparkling with interest, I've been drinking sake and it's none of your business. Flecks of spittle spattered the old man. 
Oh, that's wonderful, the old man said. Absolutely wonderful. You see, I love sake too. Every evening, me and my wife, she's 76, you know, we take our bottle of warm sake and we go out and sit on the wooden bench. We watch to see how our persimmon tree is doing. My grandfather planted that tree. We've been very concerned after those ice storms we had last winter. But you know, it's done better than we expected, especially when you consider the poor quality of the soil. And we take our sake even when it rains. He looked up at the laborer, his eyes twinkling. As he struggled to follow the old man's conversation, the drunk's face began to soften. His fists slowly unclenched. Yeah, he said, I love persimmons too. <laughs> his voice trailed off. Yes, said the old man, smiling, and I'm sure you have a wonderful wife. No, replied the laborer. My wife died. Very gently, swaying with emotion of the train, the big man began to sob. I don't got no wife. I don't got no home. I don't got no job. I'm so ashamed of myself. Tears rolled down his cheeks. A spasm of despair rippled through his body. Now it was my turn. Standing there in my well-scrubbed youthful innocence, my make-this-world-safe-for-democracy righteousness, I suddenly felt dirtier than he was. Then the train arrived at my stop. As the door opened, I heard the old man cluck sympathetically. My, my, he said, that is a difficult predicament indeed. Sit down here and tell me about it. I turned my head for one last look. The laborer was sprawled on the seat, his head in the old man's lap. The old man was softly stroking the filthy, matted hair. As the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench. What I had wanted to do with muscle had been accomplished with love. I had just seen Aikido in combat. <laughs>